Um, so yeah, uh, this is this is my presentation uh, called "Build the Thing," which is super vague, but we're going to build some things, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll learn some stuff along the way. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm Dave. Uh, I'm I'm a front end engineer at Ovo Energy, living in the absolute middle of nowhere at the moment uh, with my in laws and partner, uh, which is really really nice to avoid things like global pandemic diseases. Uh, and if you ever want to get a hold of me, um, you can hit me up on Twitter or email um, or whatever. I'm always available for a chat about anything. Um, but yeah, we're also hiring. Um, it's a really great place to work uh, if, you, if you're sort of interested in you know, green energy or really cool tech or both. Um, just give me a shout and I'll hook you up. Um, so anyway, let, let's do some things. So I'm, I'm going to start off telling a really quick story. Hopefully it'll only take about five minutes or, or so. Uh, and if you're still here, we'll, uh, we'll write some code and build some things. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have some fun there. So you're probably gonna learn uh, in about 30 seconds that I'm not a very good story writer. Uh, so I'm just going to um, hopefully go through this as fast as I can. Um, but anyway, here, here's a story. Um, once upon a time in the middle of nowhere, um, which is where we're staying, uh, my father-in-law decided that he'd build this uh, really large, really amazing natural swimming pond out in, out in their field. And it's really cool. Like it's sort of one of those things where the plant life in, in the water helps you know, pull, all the, pull all of the nutrients out of the water and the sunlight hits the water and creates more food for the plants. And there's some air pumping around for water circulation uh, and also to oxygenate the water. And there's no chemicals or, or filters or anything like that. It sort of just sustains life quite nicely. Uh, and it was really cool. It's really nice to swim in. It's got a, a shallow area and a deep area. Uh, and yeah, something was a little bit up because I sort of watched my, my father-in-law build this with his, with his bare hands. You know, he shoveled about 20, 20 tons or something of gravel and, and worked it all out how to build this thing. Uh, and I hadn't really contributed much to it other than the odd bit here and there. And, I sort of wanted to, to leave my mark on it. And so I had a bit of a think about this. And one day while we were swimming in there, um, my partner for about the millionth time claimed that the, the pond was as warm as a bath, um, which really winds me up because nothing is as warm as a bath in this country except for a warm bath. Uh, so, but it sort of triggered something in, in my mind. And, and I thought, you know what? Um, I could probably build something that we can throw into the pond that'll let us know what the temperature is uh, all the time, uh, which would be really cool. Um, so I sort of thought about how I'd go about doing that. Uh, and I gathered some things that I wanted. Uh, I knew I'd need something like a Raspberry Pi uh, and, you know, some temperature sensors and stuff to hook it all up and stuff to weatherproof it. And I needed like a 4G mo modem for it because it was out of Wi-Fi um, reception. And I sort of looked at a load of YouTube tutorials and I could give a talk on just building this alone, but that's not what this talk is about. Um, I, I sort of mashed it all together and this is kind of what I got. Um, it's sort of been a bit updated since then. I've, I've soldered all of the um, all of the components onto an actual uh, PCB so uh, things don't come apart uh, as easily as they do as, as the setup in that picture, but it's pretty good and it works. I'm really happy with it. Um, so I built that thing and then I needed to build another thing where I could actually visualize uh, all of the temperature data uh, that, I was, uh, that I was pulling in from these, from these temperature sensors. And hilariously enough, pondtemperature.com was available. Um, so, you know, this is pondtemperature.com. Uh, I still find it hilarious that I was able to get that domain. And you can see it's pretty simple. It, don't look at this on mobile or tablet because it looks like absolute garbage. I haven't been bothered to, um, to, to write the mobile or tablet starlings for this yet, mostly because um, having a baby takes up a lot of your time. Um, but you know, this works and I'm really happy with it all. Uh, and yeah, that, that works really nicely. And that's sort of the segue that I want to use into building things. Um, that was one thing that I was able to work out how to build just through YouTube tutorials and asking friends really silly questions. Um, but it leads me nicely into static site generators. Uh, you know, there's a bit flavor of the month, but they have been around for a long time and uh, they're very cool. So some of you all have heard of them and some of you uh, might not have heard of them or not quite know, not know what they are. Um, so breaking it down, you know, HTML, JavaScript, CSS comprises the static site part of the term. Uh, and a generator is a thing that creates a thing. So obviously when, 
you combine those terms together, you've got a thing that creates static sites, um, which is probably trivializing it a little bit. Um, the tooling behind these static site generators does a lot more than that. So it'll do, a lot of them handle things these days like deployments and adding an API layer, adding routing into your application and loads more stuff. Um, so it's a little bit richer than that. And there is a million of them, a million static site generators out there. Uh, and they're all pretty awesome. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about Next.js, uh, which you know a lot of you have probably heard of or used, um, or even more familiar with than I am. I'm not, I'm not a super expert on, on these things. Um, but the main thing to take away from this is that you can apply a lot of the principles that we're talking about at the moment to other, other static site generators. Uh, so, you know, we've got Next, which is a static site generator, which will spit out a React application for you, but other static site generators might spit out things like Vue or Angular or vanilla JavaScript um, sites. It really just depends. Uh, and then we've got, you know, the company behind uh, Next uh, called Vercel. They used to be called Now. Uh, the other really big thing that they've done is uh, creating a React data fetching hook called SWR, which we'll also look at tonight. Uh, and they have done a lot of other um, open source stuff and the community is really, really great. So definitely go check them out if you're not too familiar with them already. Um, so anyway, things that Next can do out of the box. Uh, starting from the top, you know, it gives you TypeScript support out of the box, which is fantastic. You know, we love TypeScript. Uh, it handles routing for you. It uses React Router under the hood and it sort of handles that layer uh, really nicely for you. It'll add an API layer into your application for you for free if you want it. Uh, mechanisms for getting static and dyna dynamic data into your application, a really good local development uh, setup. And then you get some bells and whistles as well. So you get things like performance monitoring uh, metrics straight out of the box. So you, it, it gives you a really easy way of feeding uh, that sort of data like page load times and, and error rates and all of that into third party applications or you might want to process it yourself uh, and then other things you know it's got really cool stuff built into it where it allows you to have a, a web application that has client side and server side rendering out the box without having to configure anything so that's really cool uh, and as I mentioned on the slide here as well again the the documentation and online community are really fantastic uh, from my experience but we've sort of been talking about these things uh, and I think it's time to build some things so what we're going to do, and I know there was an NPM outage earlier today, so I'm really hoping that we're, we're good at the moment. Um, but I'm going to assume that you've got NPM or Yarn installed. Uh, and uh, so if we call uh, npx create next app, and we'll call it in this directory, um, create next app. Oh, excellent. Uh, this, is, this is lovely that we're getting some nice, uh, nice <laughs> NPM errors. Uh, okay, uh, oh, uh, let's do that. That's probably a little bit of nerves. I had a spelling mistake. Cool. That should probably work now. Yeah, so Create Next App is a, uh, a scaffolding tool, uh, like a bootstrapping tool, similar to Create React App uh, and similar to, you know, the Angular CLI and all of the equivalents and, and all of your, your frameworks and all of that. And that's just going to create us uh, a really nice base application uh, that we can use. You'll see it gives us three scripts. So we've got dev, build, and start, uh, which is pretty common. So if we run uh, the dev command, that'll spin up a, um, a local dev server on port 3000. If we wait for that, uh, I'm sure that my computer is struggling a little bit at the moment because it's screen sharing and, and all of that at the same time. Webpack is not always the fastest. Um, but we've got sort of like a, a standard boilerplate application here. You know, welcome to Next.js. And it's got some stuff that le leads up to the documentation. So let's take this thing. Um, and we're in our pages directory here in the, in the root of that, which is where um, our, our pages are stored. Um, let's just strip out most of this stuff. So let's get rid of this. And let's get rid of this. And now we're just left with uh, a div that has some container styles. And you'll notice that we're importing from a style sheet. So we already know that we get uh, CSS modules out of the box for um, for free. So let's just you know create put a header in here called my things, and we can see that you know we now have my things. Uh, and just really quickly, what we'll do, I don't need that. Let's just create a new file in here as well um, to just see what other cool stuff we've got. Um, if we create a file called otherthings.js, and we'll import a default function, and we'll return one saying other 
things. Uh, if we save that and go back into our browser, and if we now go to localhost slash other things, we, we've now got the routing for straight out of the box, didn't need to do much other than create the file. And based on this um, directory and file structure, that's how we can do the, the, the paths to different pages in our, in our application. So that's just one cool thing that I thought I'd show, um, but we probably won't touch on that for the rest of this demo. Um, but what we're gonna do now is we're going to kill our dev server and we're going to, we, so we're done writing JavaScript. We now wanna write TypeScript. So we'll switch this file name to .ts, which is you know, what we sort of want to do. And we'll spin up the dev server again and see what happens. Now this time we are expecting uh, some sort of error. Yep, because you know, next is nice and it says, it looks like you're trying to use TypeScript, but you don't have the right things installed. So let's, let's install those things. So you know, we want TypeScript itself and the typings for React and Node. So we can do that. Okay, enter and that should only take a sec. And now if I run the dev server again, hopefully, you know, we've detected TypeScript in your project and created a TS config for you. That's pretty cool of you next to do that for us. Uh, and it looks like that that's compiled successfully. So if we go back to our, uh, our home page. Oh, cool. Getting all sorts of errors today. Let's, uh, let's try and spin up the dev server again. I'm gonna blame this on the, uh, the NPX. Oof, this is, this is lovely to go in a, what is, go oh, I'm an idiot. I'm sure you're all thinking, Dave, you're an idiot. Uh, don't know what's going wrong with me today. It's a TSX file, lovely. Cool, so we've got, sorry about that. Um, I have run through this a million times as well. This is very silly of me. Um, anyway, so we've now got TypeScript out of the box, which is really cool. And we didn't really have to do anything other than install TypeScript. Um, so let's just make, start to make this a little bit more uh, complex. Actually, let's make this a div. Uh, and we'll add a random thing. Uh, and let's just, um, let's add a random number in here. So math.random. Uh, times 100, that's one. So we're generating a random number between one and 100. And, and now you can see when we reload the page, we're getting a new random number. Um, and then extending from this, let's just say that we wanted to get a random number between one and 100, but we wanted to fetch that server side before feeding it into our, into our component. You know, a more real world example would be fetching a user and then passing user details into the component from, from the server before rendering. Um, but we'll just keep it simple. So next actually gives us this uh, ability. Uh, so let's say get server side props. And I think there's TypeScript typings for that. That's an async function. And if we return a uh, props object in here, of course, random thing. Uh, and we can take this, this, uh, and then I think we should just be able to pass it into home. So let's call this random thing. We we'll even type this since we've got TypeScript. This equals random thing, and that's a number. Um, and then let's just render that there. And now if we save this, oh, we need to export this as well. Um, so now when we go back into our page, we're still getting the same result, but this is actually, this random thing is now coming from the server. And that's quite handy, as I said, you know, for doing things like loading up user data um, and, and, and loads of other stuff. But uh, this is the really cool part though, is that let's just say, instead of just this page needing this bit of functionality, let's say that multiple pages need it. And we wanna make it an API endpoint instead and call into that. So what I'll do is I'll delete all of this because we don't need it. Uh, and we'll get rid of our, all of our props being passed through. We'll get rid of all of this. And what Next does is in the API directory, which is a special directory, um, we can actually create a file uh, in here. Uh, we'll call it random thing. And if we export a default function from it, uh, the function will take a request object, which will be a Next API request and a response object, which is a Next API response. Um, if we return, uh, actually, we don't need to do that. We could say um, the response.status 
is 200. So you can return a JSON object. And you can see that we're importing um, those, those types up there. Sorry about that. Um, let's do that same logic again, where we've got random thing. Times 100, one. So now, believe it or not, we actually now have an, an API endpoint that we can consume. Uh, and let's have a look at how we might do that. Oh, that's, gee, I'm full of mistakes today. <laughs> that's, I, I do bear with me. Um, okay, so we, we've got this API endpoint that we want to consume from. So this would be a good point to introduce um, a hook uh, called SWR, which say, stands for stale while revalidate. And basically what this hook does, it's got some interesting behavior. Um, in, uh, for use SWR from SWR. This hook uh, allows us to call, you know, whatever endpoint we, we want to, and it will always be revalidating data, but displaying the stale data while it's re revalidating. So, and it will update the, the UI once it gets anything new through. So it sort of lends itself quite well to reactive architecture, um, but it's probably easier to just see the thing in action. So let's make this a component now. Let's make this a random thing. And then thing, uh, and let's uh, let's call out to our endpoint. So I'll write out this line, and then I'll explain what's going on. Equals use SWR slash API slash uh, random thing. Uh, we'll pass it a fetcher function, which we'll write in a second. I'll explain that. And we've got we've got a little bit of uh, config to give to it. Uh, Revalidate on focus false. Uh, okay, so let's talk let's talk about this line here. Uh, we can even tell what we're going we're expecting back. So let's just do that now as well. Um, so what we're saying is we're using our hook uh, and we're giving it a type hint. Whoops, uh, saying that we're going to get back a random thing, which is a number, and then we're passing through the uh, the, the endpoint that we want to call, which is also the key that uh, the hook caches on, um, and then. We've got this fetcher function. All a fetcher function is in the context of SWR uh, is a function that goes and is responsible for getting your data. So we'll use a really basic one. Um, so we'll say fetcher um, is a function and it'll take a URL, which is a string, uh, and it'll fetch that URL. And then we'll take the response and we'll convert it to JSON. Um, and that's all our fetcher function is. Obviously, you know, in a real world, you know, you might be adding you know, request headers and stuff like that, you, or you might be using an API service to make that call, but we're just going to keep it basic. Um, and then this revalidate on focus, basically anytime uh, the window gets focus or the, 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 the component gets focus that we're talking about, uh, SWR by default will try and revalidate that data by calling out to the endpoint and updating the UI if it needs to. And because we know this, uh, endpoint is returning random data. We don't really want that to happen, otherwise it's always going to be displaying new data. Um, but anyway, and then we have the data object itself that comes back. So what we can say is if there's no data, let's uh, return uh, a div, let's say loading. Uh, and then if we have our data, um, by this point, we can just say random thing data dot and because we gave it that type hint uh, when we called the hook we've got autocomplete on that and now we've actually got an endpoint that we can call so if we spin up the um, or that sorry that's we are now calling that endpoint so now if we, we come back in here we can see once again it's the same functionality but if I pop open uh, our network tab and reload you'll see that we've actually called an endpoint and we've got that for free and that's really really cool um, so that was pretty quick to build up something that you know fetches stuff from a back end and displays it on a front end. Um, and that was really cool. Uh, but I uh, won't go back to full screen here. We need to get this on the internet because um, it's not very fun if we if we're not sharing it with all of our friends. So what we're going to do is we'll kill the dev server and build the thing. And we'll push that upstream. So we we'll hit my GitHub repository. Uh, and then I'm logged into Vercel's, uh, you know, interface online, so Vercel.com. I've created an account and integrated it with my GitHub account. That takes five seconds. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty easy to do. But we'll hit import project. And 
hopefully this loads. Let's try it in another tab. Okay, apparently it works in another tab. Um, so we'll go to github.com slash krug slash, uh, what do I call this, build the thing. I'll make this repository public as well, if it's not already, um, so that you can all sort of have a look at this. But anyway, the cell's already worked out that we've got a next application. Um, and there's a load of presets, but loads and loads of things. Um, so feel free to have a look at, a look at that. Uh, and we'll leave all of the defaults. You know, we don't want to inject any environment variables. Um, okay, thanks for cell. Have we actually pushed that upstream to master? Build the thing, let's try it one more time. Okay, um, on. Don't do me like this, the cell. <laughs> I'm not really getting much luck here. Um, let's let's try that again. Um, GitHub.com slash grog slash build the thing. All right, let's try that. Please work. <laughs> this is so silly. <laughs> cool. Okay, so this is. That, yeah, you shouldn't really run into those problems. I don't know what's going on now. I do blame the NPM outage from earlier today. It's probably caused some problems in a lot of places. But anyway, so Vercel's building my project for me. Uh, and, you know, this looks pretty similar to standard build output. Um, and hopefully uh, it will create and upload my project for me. Cool. So congrats, your project's been deployed. Really nice confetti, uh, lovely. And what we can do is we can visit that. And you'll see that if you now go to, and you can do this in your browser as well, if you go to build the thing app, you'll actually see that my thing's there. You know, that, that didn't take too long. And you know, if we go into the, the, the network tab, you can see that that actually is calling out to my API that I've written. Um, and you know, we got that all that for free and didn't have to worry about you know, creating the infrastructure behind that. Um, and then lastly, in terms of building these cool things, I just want to show you one last thing. If we create a new branch, uh, build another thing, and let's build another thing real quickly. So uh, let's call this another thing. And we go another thing. Let's just return, I don't know, a H1, my name is Dave. Save that. And because we're naughty, we're not gonna test that locally. We'll just assume that works. Built another thing. We'll push that upstream. Cool. And if we go into GitHub, and we create a pull request for this. You'll see that the cell's already got some hooks into our, into our PR stuff. You can see it's, the bot has already added a comment into this, being like, you know, you can go and inspect the build for this. That's quite nice. You'll be very familiar with this for things, you know, with your, your CI CD pipelines. Uh, and you'll see that that's running the same build that it did before. It's doing all the things it needs to do and uploading it. And then hopefully in just a second, I don't need to keep stalling for time, build complete. And if we come in here uh, any second now, this should probably update and you'll see that it's updated. And we now have a link that's straight out to uh, a, a build environment for this branch um, with my changes, but it's, it's not on the, it's not on master yet, but this makes it really handy for when you're, you know, you're, you're viewing people's PRs and you don't need to spin up your own, um, your own environment, you know, you don't need to spin up locally and test it. You can actually see it running in your browser straight away. Uh, and Kieran's actually going to be talking to you about some similar ish stuff that you can achieve with, with uh, GitHub actions in a little bit. Um, so that should be a, that's a, a nice little segue there. Um, but that's all I wanted to show you from, the, I guess, the next side of things. Um, and which, you know, I, I think it's pretty cool to, See, you know, we haven't even been doing this for half an hour and we've got, you know, a TypeScript application that uses CSS modules that calls an API endpoint. Uh, it's, it has automatic build pipelines. 
it has per branch environments. It deploys to the internet. It gives you nice URLs. If you wanted to use a custom URL as well, uh, Vassell lets you do that really easy as well. You know, it's doing all of these things and we didn't need to worry about like all of the, the, the DevOps, the infrastructure side of things. We didn't have to waste time setting it up and swearing too much at our computers because nothing's working and all of that. And I guess the point that I want to make about all of this is that if you've, if you've got a project that you know you want you really want to build but you've been procrastinating about you know whether it's a blog site or it's something like what i've done where i just want to display some data for a, a personal house project that i've been working on or anything like that um just just build it and and you leverage the tooling that is available by these things to, to to get this thing on the internet show your friends show your family show hacker news show show strangers on the internet um i just really want to i, I hope that some people We'll, we'll see thing, presentations like this and be inspired to, to go and actually do those things. And, and yeah, that's, that's basically what I want to talk to you about. Um, the, the code for tonight's up on that repository and there's some links to, to Next.js and Vercel. Definitely go check it out. Um, as I said at the beginning of the talk, if you ever want to talk to me about these sorts of things, I'm, I'm always, up for, always up for a chat about that stuff. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Um, I really appreciate you know having having your time and uh, thank you very much for listening.